Good morning. I'm Marion Ryan, the District Attorney of Middlesex County. I'm very happy to be joined here this morning by Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins, Wendy Waynes, the Director of the Committee for Public Counsel Immigration Impact Unit, Anthony Benedetti, the Chief Counsel of CPCS, Gladys Vega, the Executive Director of the Chelsea Collaborative, Yvonne Espinoza Madrigal, the Executive Director of Lawyers for Civil Rights, and Oren Nimney from Lawyers for Civil Rights, as well as David Zimmer from Goodwin. We are here because just a few moments ago, joined together as plaintiffs, we filed a lawsuit in the federal court. A lawsuit which we believe to be a first of its kind, collective plaintiffs. This lawsuit seeks a declaration from the court that the written ICE directive which authorizes the arrest of people on civil charges using the courts of the Commonwealth is unlawful. It also seeks a finding that the policy in place in being enforced by ICE violates both the constitutional rights of individuals to access the courts and the long-standing federal and Massachusetts common law privilege that against such arrests. We seek an injunction directing ICE to cease making those arrests who every single day when the courts of the Commonwealth open come to court seeking help. They may be there as the victims of a violent crime. They may be there as a witness. They may be there as someone who's been charged with a crime. They may be there seeking some other form of help, guardianship for a family member, protection from a landlord or an employer, or protection from an abuser in their own home. To the extent that the practices of ICE in apprehending them while they are coming, going, or exercising and conducting their business in the court has chilled their right to do that, that is an assault on our justice system. It is one which cannot continue. For me, this lawsuit is really about two things. As the District Attorney of Middlesex County, my core mission is the protection of the public safety of the 1.6 million people in the largest county in the state. Our accomplishment of that objective usually lies in the prosecution of criminal cases. In order to do that effectively, we must rely on the cooperation of witnesses, victims, we need to have present in court those who have been accused as well as their witnesses. Asking anyone under any circumstances to engage in that process, which at its best day is frightening, confusing, and time consuming, is difficult. To ask people to engage in that process with all of its complications, when they themselves fear that their very coming to court will cause them to be whisked away by ICE, or perhaps even more tragically, when they fear that their coming to court will lead to actions of ICE which will disrupt and tear apart their families makes our prosecution of cases more difficult and in many, many cases impossible. Because what then is the result? And these are real results and you'll hear about some of these examples. The result of this fear that keeps people from exercising their right to come to court is that victims suffer in silence People continue to be abused in their homes. 
witnesses who may have seen something happen to any one of us, or a member of our families, randomly been in a place where they saw something, are forced to choose between the protection of themselves and their family and their civic duty to come forward. Offenders often choose not to take the risk and do not come to court to have their case resolved. And this is the public safety piece that is so critical. Because when we cannot hold anyone accountable for their actions, let me be clear, that is not justice and not one person in this Commonwealth is safer because of that practice. And having spent my career as a trial and appellate attorney in courts across the Commonwealth, I believe firmly in the sanctity of our courts. That is precisely why the plaintiffs today have chosen to use the court to file this lawsuit, to put an end to the practice of ICE. Let's just remember, and it's becoming somewhat harder to remember this. One of the primary reasons that the United States of America enjoys the position of respect, which it does on the world stage, is precisely because of its respect for the rule of law and for what have been for over 200 years the hallmarks of our court system. That is a culture of fairness, of impartiality, and civility. Over 200 years. That is who we are. And yet, over the last two years, due to these practices, we have seen that culture replaced by something truly frightening, and that is the culture of fear. All actors in the court system have a role to play in resolving and restoring that culture and clarifying who we are as Americans. It's that sense of fairness and above all, our commitment to the shared values and the shared belief in that traditions of our court that has led us in this unprecedented filing to bring together prosecutors, defense counsel, community members, to file this lawsuit. We have been working on this lawsuit for over a year. Its filing this morning would not have been possible, both for District Attorney Rollins and myself, without our partners here at Goodwin. We owe you a great debt. Goodwin has taken on this case as a pro bono effort. We are grateful for that. As I just said, we've been working on this lawsuit for over a year. So it's important to note that it stands separate and apart from other cases that occurred in the federal court last week. However, that case itself demonstrates what the need for what we seek here today. And that is a clear and formal ruling from the court as to what the culture of our courthouses will be. I am proud to stand here today with the other plaintiffs in the defense of the sanctity of our courts and the protection of the public safety. I now turn the podium over to my colleague, Rachel Rollins, the District Attorney of Suffolk County. This suit marks an historic moment. I do not take this action lightly, but standing by silently as immigration officials under the explicit direction of the President of the United States strip our justice system of its ability to function simply is not an option. As District Attorney of Suffolk County, I represent one of Massachusetts's most diverse and vibrant regions. Since taking office, I've watched serious criminal cases against individuals accused of violent, heinous crimes grind to a halt because of a civil arrest by ICE. 
As prosecutors, we cannot fulfill our statutory obligation to victims of crimes when ICE unilaterally engages in civil arrests. Our legislature here in Massachusetts, under Mass General Laws Section Chapter 258B, created a Victims' Bill of Rights, which could be violated every time ICE conducts a civil arrest and removes someone from a courthouse without our knowledge. Who is responsible for telling that victim that their case will not be moving forward? That we don't know where their rapist is? That they will never have a chance to confront the individual accused of hurting them or their loved one? ICE isn't making those phone calls. ICE isn't sitting with those victims. We are, as district attorneys. It's difficult enough to convince a traumatized victim or witness of violence to cooperate in a criminal case. They often face intimidation and fear in the wake of such offenses. That fear should never be exacerbated by members of law enforcement. Shamefully, that is exactly what ICE is doing. When federal immigration authorities place themselves inside the very courthouses that vulnerable individuals rely on for help and justice, it creates a chilling effect and an even greater sense of fear. Not only are people afraid of violent offenders, but they are also terrified of the authorities. These actions do nothing to further public safety or the rule of law. In fact, as we've laid out in the suit filed today, ICE's directives violates multiple well-established legal principles. I have made clear time and time again that I take no issue with immigration officials removing a non-citizen convicted of a serious felony after that individual has been held accountable and served their time. I am not asking, nor am I intending to interfere with the federal government when they engage in and exercise their lawful authority. I simply ask that they pay us the same respect and not interfere with ours. Thank you. Wendy Waynes from CPS will be next. Thank you. I'm Wendy Wayne. I'm the director of the Immigration Impact Unit at CPCS. The Committee for Public Counsel Services is the Massachusetts Public Defender Agency, and we are responsible for representing all indigent individuals who have a right to counsel under Mass in Massachusetts. Here are just a few examples of how ICE officers have been invading our state courthouses and obstructing the administration of justice in Massachusetts almost daily for the last two years. A critical eyewitness is too afraid to come to court to testify. ICE officers mistakenly arrest and handcuff someone in a courthouse, then have to find a handsaw to saw off his handcuffs because they lost the key. ICE agents are overheard by members of the public telling someone they're dragging out of a courthouse that they are not kidnappers. State court officers are forced to intervene during an ICE arrest in a courthouse lobby, which onlookers think is a civilian fistfight. ICE agents yell threateningly at a court interpreter, demanding to know what she interpreted between an attorney and his client. Our courts are places where individuals, regardless of income or influence or status, must be able to seek justice, to exercise their constitutional rights, to seek safety from physical harm or compensation for economic harm. Access to state courts is absolutely vital to a functioning and fair society. We are not challenging ICE's ability to enforce immigration laws. We are challenging where they do this enforcement. We are demanding that ICE stop the aggressive armed patrolling of our state courthouses, places where all people have a right to seek justice and where ICE's actions are preventing that justice from happening. Now I'd like to introduce Gladys Vega, Executive Director of the Chelsea Collaborative. Thank you. My name is Gladys Vega from the Chelsea Collaborative. I lived in um, Chelsea for approximately 41 years. I have done a lot of work in, within the immigrant community. I have never had a problem accessing the court system. I have never had a problem 
convincing our families that if they were victims of a crime, to go to court because you have access to justice. There, that is not the case right now. The real situation right now is that people are afraid. I have to think that um, anyone who was part of creating this policy should be shameful because there's no justice being served. Two years ago or prior than that, we have Oasis Travel. I work with members of the community in the Chelsea Housing Authority case. That was a federal case against the Housing Authority. A lot of people went, many moms that were undocumented went to the courthouse. They had no problem testifying of what they saw. That is not the case now. The case is that we see three to five cases a week. We have to mediate. We have to bring the Chelsea Police Department to help us um, mediate disputes, help us deal with um, thefts, um, help us deal with, in particular, um, a case that I cannot talk about, but with the district attorney assistance lawyers have gone to houses to collect these claims because people do not want to go to court. When we always sort of like promoted that in Chelsea, we're a sanctuary city, we have no issues with the court. We are police officers and our judicial system are our friends and they're there regardless of race or status. And that is not the case now. So we are here and I am delighted that we are finally putting this together because we have no resources to continue to do this work. And this was not the, our mandate. Um, it, this should not be happening in a community. When people have no access to justice, they continue to be victims of crime. Their situation doesn't change. When a, 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 a woman of domestic violence walks away and doesn't get their one year extension because she only has a temporary order for 10 days and is afraid of going back for the one year extension, that cannot happen. That victim continues to have that person that is committing a crime to her, the abuser, right next to her all the time. And that is what's happening in our community and that should not be happening. So we're extremely happy that good one and um, the, the lawyers um, and everyone who's here sort of like in this lawsuit and the, the, uh, the district attorneys are here because they see this all the time. We're seeing in our community. And once again, this should not happen. The court system should be like a, a, a sanctuary space. I think court, um, courthouses should recognize that as well. Our residents need access to um, justice and having eyes in the courtroom, um, in, it's not access to um, judicial system. You are denying um, the rights of, of justice and I, that should not happen in our community. Thank you. And now I'm gonna introduce Ivan Espinosa Madrigal, the lawyer from civil rights. Buenos dias, good morning. My name is Ivan Espinosa Madrigal. I am the executive director of Lawyers for Civil Rights. Under the Trump administration, all immigrants are now bad. So bad that they shouldn't have access to something as fundamental as their day in court. Let's be clear. Immigrants are being hunted down. And this is harmful to all of us. And we are fighting back. This is our legal and moral responsibility. In Massachusetts, we have been in the forefront of protecting immigrant communities. At Lawyers for Civil Rights, we were the first organization in the country to sue to protect sanctuary cities, the first to sue to save temporary protected status for Central American immigrants, and now the first to sue to stop ICE arrests in courts. And we are extremely proud to join forces today with Goodwin, District Attorney Ryan, District Attorney Rawlins, CPCS, and the Courageous Chelsea Collaborative and its membership on behalf of whom this lawsuit is being filed. This case creates a blueprint for advocates across the country who want to protect immigrants and make sure that we can hold down the line as excesses from the federal government challenge our families and the safety in our communities. Thank you for being here this morning. We'll take some of your questions. Isn't ICE 
just following immigration law by doing so? ICE has issued a directive, which is a written directive, which they are following, that allows them to avoid both the constitutional right to access to the court as well as what has been recognized as a long-standing common law privilege, both in the federal court and in Massachusetts state court, that one has the right to go to, do your business at court, and return from court without being subject to arrest. Yeah, Ryan, in 2017, um, the Mass trial court passed down that directive to the courts to say, we have to follow this. So what's, what's changed? Why has why is the Mass trial court supporting this That's a question for the trial court. Yeah. So how many witnesses and victims are being targeted by ICE? I mean, not defendants, not offenders. How many witnesses are being targeted by ICE? As you heard a few examples, and I'm sure DA Rollins would agree, we see a number of individuals who are helpful and cooperative in an early stage and then become uncooperative as the case wends its way through. Remember, many of the people that we are talking about come from countries where the government truly is not their friend. They do not see a big distinction between the district attorney, the police, and national immigration authorities. So do they always tell us that is the reason they are not coming back? No. But when you have a situation where ICE appears on the steps of a courthouse, and the next day, many of our witnesses and victims do not come back, it's a pretty easy connection to make. In the case of last week, uh, the ADA that was there, was there anything that they could have done to intervene to, in the case of Judge Joseph? We've said this case is different from that. As you will note on the tape in that case, the DA indicated that the enforcement piece, and we are not challenging the right of ICE to conduct their business. That's what's important. And the right of people who may be in custody and ICE has a, a warrant for them, a civil warrant for them, that is all part of ICE doing its job. This lawsuit does not address this. This addresses people who come voluntarily to court. They are at liberty in, the, in our communities. They voluntarily come to court. And then they are subject to being arrest, arrested by ICE while they are there. This is for DA Rollins. Um, based on the policy <coughs> memo, are you at all worried that you would face possible arrest from the, the way Judge Joseph did? Not even close. I don't have a single worry. Um, I have approximately 300 employees. I've simply asked that if they do see something in the courthouse, that they notify me. Um, asking your employees to notify you um, of something that occurs in a workplace that they attend and show up to every day is completely lawful. Um, further, as I said earlier, we have an obligation to our victims. Uh, if I don't know where my defendant is and um, they were, uh, and, and by the way, I really hope everyone understands the distinction we're making. This is a civil arrest. ICE loves talking about violent criminal defendants. District Attorney Ryan and I know what vi violent criminal defendants are because we prosecute them every day. And the people they're in fact taking that are defendants, they are our violent criminal defendants that have yet to be held accountable, yet to have their day in court. Victims are not being told where they are. And I'm left with my colleague here trying to explain what happened and trying to find an individual. So I am in no fear of arrest. And very candidly, if I am, it would be my honor to be because we need to stand up and be very, very bold about this ridiculous behavior that our president is engaging in right now. Usually you hear, you hear law enforcement folks like yourselves and the feds talk about joint cooperative ventures, close working cooperation. It appears as though this relationship has just evolved into a political war. Was the arrest of that judge nothing more than a political stunt? This case, is about our belief that people have a constitutional right to go to the courthouse to the extent that they are prohibited from doing that. And it causes us to be in a position, not one of us, not one person in this room is safer when we have a situation where someone's charged with a violent offense. The victim or the witness in that case cannot or will not come to court because of the actions of ICE. The logical result of that is 
we cannot then go forward with that case and that person cannot be held accountable. That is not protecting the public safety. That's where we are. And seeing that happen and seeing, as DA Rollins mentioned, our victims and witnesses who now may have been assaulted by someone who's been released back into the community, you will know many of the people who are detained are later released on bail by the immigration judge. So they are out in the community. We are not safer because of that. Relationship been fractured beyond repair because of politics? No, I no. used to work in that yeah. office. I have a uh, deep respect for U.S. Attorney Lelling. You saw me stand next to him and his wonderful uh, team with the Jesse Carrera matter. We are we are being respectful and we're filing a lawsuit. This is the way we operate when we think something isn't fair or just. We've used um, the systems available to us. I have a, I, I have no problem. We can disagree without being disagreeable. Do you blame the U.S. Attorney? Do you blame the Attorney General? Do you blame the President? Where does the responsibility lie for what's happening? The a directive has been issued by the Department of Immigration Control and Enforcement. How that evolves or who has responsibility for that, I think we all have a view about that. That is a what separate is That's a separate question. That obviously one assumes that people don't do things without approval from whomever they report to. Maria. Maria's been waiting forever. Yeah. On the NBC shot down similar request last year, how is it different from that? Part of that, we and I signed on to that petition seeking an order from the Supreme Judicial Court. It is our belief, based on the ruling in that case, that where we needed to go was to the federal court. That's why we have this morning filed this, this complaint. I just want to say that the, the SJC, the single justice who heard that case, did acknowledge that Massachusetts courts have had that these ICE arrests are impacting the administration of justice and access to justice, and that Massachusetts, under Massachusetts law, there is a long-standing privilege protecting people from civil arrests when they're trying to come to court. Um, but the single justice said that it was more appropriate that this case be heard in the federal courts. And, and to piggyback on that, what responsibility does the trial court have here? Have you gone to the trial court the way that uh, Immigration Advocates in New York has successfully to get changes um, passed or pushed through a policy where um, ICE would not be allowed in court unless they had a judicial warrant? I mean, I think that ultimately, um, because ICE officers are federal immigration agents, that um, enforcement needs to be done in federal court. I mean, the New York policy is wonderful and the New York courts have stood up strongly. And I hope very much that ICE um, officers abide by that and do not arrest people in the courthouses. But if they don't, that may very well end up in federal court as well. In addition to that, just to note that policy covers the inside of courthouses. What we're seeing every day is people being arrested before they come into court, when they're getting out of their cars in the parking lot, in the, in the steps outside the courthouse, so that they just never show up in court and people don't know what happened to them, sometimes for a few days, if they're taken in immigration custody, until they have a right to make a phone call. I think that's a, as as DA Ryan said. I think that's a question for the trial court. Do you have any other DAs in the state on board, or are they not on board with this? We can speak. DA Rollins and I speak for ourselves, obviously, with respect to the litigation that's been. We've been working on this case for well over a year now. And I took office January second. On January seventh. Uh, there was an incident in the public area of Suffolk County Courthouse, uh, Superior Court, uh, and I made a phone call to the Attorney General immediately to say uh, five uh, plainclothes individuals just dragged somebody into an elevator while he was yelling for his lawyer. Um, I want to file an injunction or do something, and I immediately was um, placed over in the very capable hands of Goodwin Proctor, CPCS, uh, lawyers for Civil Rights and DA Ryan. So I picked up the phone the instant something happened and got involved. Approximately how many cases have been impacted? Is there a number that you can? Well, you can see from the complaints, there are probably 15 or 20 cases that are cited in there. When, as I mentioned before, we don't always know. That's why people don't come back. We have seen at least two cases where cases were actually interrupted during the day, either at the break or at lunch when during that period of time, someone disappeared, a necessary party disappeared from the courthouse and we weren't able to go forward. So if you're successful with this, I 
I mean, you're, you're hoping to get this injunction, but how do you ensure that this actually removes ICE from the equation on these <coughs> civil issues? How do you ensure that they're actually removed from the courthouses or outside of the courthouses? Well, what we, we ask in the complaint that the privilege, the long-standing privilege, which allows people to come and go and be in the courthouse. So the parking lots, the front stairs of the courthouse, those places, we are hoping that the court will agree with us, will enforce that privilege, and will issue injunctive relief or ultimately a ruling in the case that will cause ICE to depart from this policy. I just, I just want to add, sorry, I just want to add something. Um, just as far as the numbers, we do not have um, sort of concrete numbers because there are many different influences and many different factors that, that may cause somebody not to come to court, both criminal defendants, witnesses, victims, and cases. Um, but I will say uh, the CPCS Immigration Impact has been receiving several calls, at a minimum, several calls per week for the last two years from defense attorneys about their clients being arrested while they were trying to come into court about, I don't know what happened to my client. It took me two days to find them. Um, and those are just criminal defendants. What, what I don't know if we have made clear enough is that the chilling effect that this has when the reputation in communities is that ICE is patrolling the courthouses. Chelsea District Court for a long time has had the reputation that ICE is outside the courthouse several times per week, inside the courthouse several times per week. So what risk do people want to take if they are afraid of, of a civil ICE arrest of coming to the courthouse to seek justice? Mm -hmm. Just to your point, hold on. Just to your point, sir. Um, that's why I want my staff to tell me when things happen so we can, I don't know what just happened here, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but my point is simply, that's why I'm asking my staff, to, well, they're not to obstruct, they're not to get involved at all, simply call and let us know so we can have an accurate account. And Chelsea District Court is in Suffolk County. We are also looking at those numbers with the Chelsea Collaborative as well. What you see in the complaint as well is that from the Chelsea Collaborative, the number of cases where people should have been in the courthouse seeking redress from either actions by their employers or their landlords or someone else, they are now handling, I believe the number is three to five mediations a week. That is an attempt to be clear. That is somebody can't go to the courthouse to get relief. So Chelsea Collaborative has stepped in to try to fill the breach there and hold those mediations. So we do know all of those should be at the courthouse, but instead they are in the offices of Chelsea Collaborative. Last question. Can you elaborate a little bit on the ways in which ICE interacts with court interpreters or public defenders and whether that in particular might be violating any laws or the extent to which ICE is seeking out certain information from those individuals? Um, I don't know that um, I can address, I can address specifically, you know, each example is different as to whether they're violating certain laws, but um, for, you know, some of the examples we have, which shows a disruptive nature of ICE enforced civil enforcement in the courthouses is discussion is, you know, asking court interpreters, tell me what you just interpreted. That's attorney client privilege. Um, interpreter can't do that without risking losing her job. Um, state court officers being told by the trial court, don't get involved with immigration enforcement, but then in the public you know, lobby of a courthouse, there's a fit, what looks like a fist fight going on. So court personnel are often being dragged into this. Defense attorneys are, we advise people every day, defense attorneys, um, about you know, how to continue zealously representing their clients without potentially running afoul of any federal law. But zealously representing their clients is not only a constitutional right, it is their duty. And they, they must continue to represent those clients. And how do they do that without you know, the interference by ICE civil enforcement? What are the laws you're alleging that ICE is breaking here? As it's laid out in the complaint, we are alleging a violation of the common law privilege. And common law is a privilege that is found in the case law that's in the complaint. We are also alleging a violation of the federal common law privilege to access, and that's laid out in the complaint as well. Um, and we seek that injunctive release, ba relief based on a number of cases that the harm may be irreparable, and the only way to prevent that harm is for the court to ask. Thank you all for being here. Can you ask the judges to, to stand with you, the administrative you know, level of the justice system or the, or the justices of the SJC, to take a stance in support of this judge? to take a stance and say something publicly 
that they're either with you or, the, or they're, 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 they don't want to get involved? Again, a question for the child court. Is there any upper Thank ballpark you. for the number of kids? Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 